Why is this meeting today important? Uh, it's important because we have a commission that's only placating us in terms of meeting about proposals that are going to actually slash and burn Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And so we're here because we got less than 24 hour notice and we felt that there are many other communities that won't have the opportunity to be here. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to be strong with our allies to, to say that this is unacceptable and this is unaccessible. Good morning. My name is Donna Frescator and I'm New York State's Medicaid Director. Thank you for joining us this morning for the first uh, public forum, in-person public forum, of the Medicaid Redesign uh, Team 2. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us. Today is our first um, public comment, in-person public comment session, um, and we'll move to that very quickly. Number one. I can't stomach this anymore. You know, this should have been the people's mic. And I need our folks here who are with us to repeat it. This commission is a sham. To get less than 24 hour notice is unacceptable. Repeat. But what is this meeting about? It's about uh, Medicaid cuts. And you're the person who's going to suffer with Medicaid. Yes, yes. So you should be invited, yes. right? Yes. To, to comment. Yes, yes. So why do you think they didn't invite, why didn't you hear about it till the last minute? This shows how little they care about our community. And it's terrible. So I, I'm very glad that I'm here. Mm -hmm. Very glad. Okay. It's a great way to spend Valentine's Day. My name is Ralph Bourne, and I am a self-advocate getting IDD services. I'm on the autism spectrum with a number of medical problems that become sig more significant in the more than 10 years now. And I've had a lot of variability over my life course, and now I live hour to hour, not day to day. I could probably go toe to toe. Uh, on a technical level with anybody up there. And so, you know, I welcome real dialogue going forward. We're not getting it here today. A lot of the data was misleading. I have to say that I, I've lost complete credibility with this process. Talk, okay, can you say that again? I think this is a sham. They, this is the second time that this, uh, that they didn't schedule the meeting with an, enough advance notice for people to get out of here, it that clearly tells me that they don't really want to know from the community. They want to hear from the community that they already have their mind made up as to what they're going to do. And I've always believed nothing about us without us kind of theme. So if you don't hear from the people that it, that it's going to affect the most, then why are you there? Why are you here? How are you supposed to help us? 
Right, this is supposed to be a public meeting so the public can input, right? Yes. And there's only, to my knowledge, there's only one recently disabled person on the board. I mean, how long did it take you to figure that out? You're making decisions for people with disabilities and there's nobody on your board up until just recently, maybe a few weeks ago, now there's somebody on the board? You've been around for a while. These cuts that you're making won't affect you because you're not, you don't need the services we need. You don't need home care. You don't need special to see specialists. Um, it's very hard to find a doctor that'll take Medicaid because um, they don't want it because it, it's a lot of red tape and now you're making it more difficult. Listen, I pay taxes, I vote, I speak for the community. I'm here. I'm not invisible. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here for as long as I can to be a royal pain in the butt to you guys. Thank you. That was great. My name is Milagros Franco. I'm from the Brooklyn Center for the Independence of the Disabled. Um, Donna, did you know that one of your board members is missing? I guess you're not going to respond, but maybe you didn't know the board's lack of forethought and giving us advance notice affects one of your own board members, T.K. Small. He, he's, he's, he was, uh, I guess, appointed to the board so you guys can get feedback from the disabled community. To me, this is just another uh, way of, I guess, it's showing another form of disrespect. But anyway, let me move on. I'm honest, I'm obviously a Medicaid user, and um, I'm grateful for the services that I have, but all I keep hearing is the cutbacks. And the cutbacks are just going to make getting services that we have now more difficult. It's hard to find a specialist that wants to ex accept Medicaid because Medicaid takes a long time to reimburse them and it's, it's at a lower uh, rate than most other doctors, other insurances. Now, if I, could, if I could afford something else, I would. And even though I'm working, I, I can't afford any other insurance, so I need Medicaid to work for me. I am an active member in the community. I get up and go to work every day. I help the disabled community with the various different things. And it's not just me, it's other people here that do the same thing. What does this meeting mean to you? I, it's very meaningful to me because I'm representing a whole lot of people with disabilities who couldn't make it because they decided to announce this so short notice. And I wanna be the voice for the people who could not make it here today. So why do you think they announced it with such short notice? Because they don't want us here. <laughs> and why is that? They don't want a real life experience to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. it, make, it gets in the way of making cuts, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Right. It's not just numbers, it's people, it's right? It's people, it's faces. Yeah. And who's this That's little girl? Mayim. Mayim? A boy or a girl? A girl. Hi there, Mayim. <laughs> so she could, I've seen like you, I've seen you were around like downtown Brooklyn. You worked down there? I do. Yeah, and I saw you with the uh, <laughs> with the dog. I'm like, she's got it going on. <laughs> so, okay, great. Thanks a lot. My name is Jessica, and I'm with the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. I'm here today to speak on behalf of all persons with disabilities, including myself. There should be no decision without us. The services that you're trying to cut will affect our lives. For some of us, it will even kill us. Medicaid is important to me. The device you see me in right now allows me to get around, the way you just so gracefully saw me come around here. This is not only a device, but it is my legs. It is an extension of my body. It's my means of mobility. My home care is my means of independence, all thanks to Medicaid. My partner of three years sustained a spinal cord injury when he was 15 years old. He broke his neck in a diving accident and therefore has to have 24-hour home care to live independently. In our pillow talk as a couple, he has expressed to me several times that he'd rather be dead than live in a nursing home. And if cuts are made to Medicaid, that's exactly what's gonna happen to him and many others. 
We don't talk about getting married. We talk about death instead. Does that say anything to you? Do you talk about death to your loved ones because your services are going to be cut so drastically that you're going to be placed in a nursing home? Because this meeting was so short notice and very clearly on purpose, so not to put a face to your guilt in your poor decisions on making cuts. So if you make the cuts, my partner, Jose Hernandez, face doesn't come to your mind of him dying in a nursing home because of your poor choices. Not many of my friends could be here today to represent themselves, but I want you to realize that the few of us that are here are here to speak for all of us, to make you realize that you are doing much more harm than good. Do not cut my Medicaid. Nothing about us without us. Put my face in your brain. Don't forget me when you're making those cuts. Remember Jose Hernandez when you make the cuts. Remember everybody's faces when you make these cuts. I love the woman who's barely even looking at me right there, yeah. Remember my face so you can put that guilt to your decision. I appreciate that the governor said that uh, his intention is not to, that there be no cuts to um, eligibility and no cuts to benefits and services, um, but for people with disabilities, that's uh, not a very, um, well, we saw what happened with the last MRT. Much of the savings that ha were uh, accrued to the state were at the expense of people with disabilities. And an example would be someone who got 24 hours, seven days a week of home care, they're saying, oh, you can have four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon. This is a person that needs to be turned every two hours to avoid skin breakdown and uh, bed sores. <laughs> so of course, then you're gonna have the additional cost of uh, you know, a wound care nurse coming in or hospitalization, but that'll probably fall on the Medicare program now, won't it? So, but this is what we have seen, that it's only due process and the ability to request fair hearings that has protected people with disabilities from these home care cuts. So then we see, oh, let's try to cut people's access to due process. So, anyway. <laughs> We, we, we've seen from the last Medicaid redesign team what, is, what has happened uh, to, to people with disabilities and the cuts and benefits and services that have resulted. Hi, how you doing? I'm sorry I'm not very well dressed. Uh, those of you who know me know I put on a jacket, I clean up very nicely. But I just heard about this as I was walking the dog and I had to rush out because this is important. Now, I'm here to speak for my son who has cerebral palsy. He can't be here. But he can't be here not because his home health attendant didn't make it today, but that's happened. And he can't be here not because there's a problem with a feeding tube or an assistive device or accessoride, but that's happened, except he doesn't have a feeding tube. He's here because he's in college right now and he's studying. And I got a letter yesterday, an email, I'm sorry, letters are old, uh, that he made the dean's list. And I'm really happy. And. Um, this is a success. This is what Medicaid can do. But I don't know if you remember me or saw me on TV. It wasn't easy to get him to college. We had to get the mayor to tweet to say that Purchase should let my son in. And we had to get the governor to tell Purchase to let him in. And that wasn't the end of the fight. That was the beginning because we were transitioning between one program and another program and the aide who was working in the house wasn't cleared for the other program and the people who were going to work to help him at college weren't cleared to work for him because there's so much bureaucracy and it's a full time job that you have to involve the mayor and the governor to send your kid with cerebral palsy to school and you want to know the worst thing it's a house of cards any little thing cd pap cut um, the community have, I saw the director of the OPWDD, why do I even have to know those initials saying that, uh, you know, too much community have, that's how he is in the community. That is how he is a success, okay? And any of these cuts that you're talking about are gonna make this house of cards collapse. Now, I see a lot of terms that I don't understand, and there's a lot of them that I do because I've become kind of an expert in this, 
right? You know, there are CCOs, and we had a care manager, and now it's something else. There's uh, managed care, there's health homes, there's SLPs, there's so much to figure out. But you want to know something? When you cut, you're not adjusting a formula or taking an action. You're pulling a walker out from a disabled kid. He's falling on the floor. And not one of you would do that if you, could, if you had to do it physically. But that's the impact of what these Medicaid cuts have on people. And these hearings, we shouldn't even have to come and explain this. And we shouldn't have to redo the DDP2 for a CAS that takes a lot of time with a thousand questions because that's stressful for everyone involved. And it takes time. And it cuts down productivity. And it takes you out of the workplace. And it takes your kid who could be in the workplace and will be in the workplace if you don't cut Medicaid out of the workplace and that makes the tax base go down and everything so what I'd like to say is let's focus on getting people the services they are entitled to entitled to not even most people don't even know a tenth of what they're entitled to in a timely and dignified manner not a cheap thing not a suspicion that well maybe you're frauding the system or maybe no with dignity say hey listen we're going to make you whole we're going to make you part of society a functioning part of society and that's a win win and let's invest caregivers with dignity and money because everyone's got market-based solutions. I heard uh, the old president or whatever of the OPWDD, I forget her name, saying that competition is good. No, competition doesn't work when you don't understand it. And the only difference between one agency and another or one plan or the other is that you can't get what you need when you don't know you need it. So let's take that element away and judge it on are you giving the services that people need and are they getting it so they can do it in a timely manner? It took five years to get his Medicaid waiver, my son's Medicaid waiver. That's five years. That's a marriage destroyed. That's a lot of pain, okay? So let's get rid of that. And when the problem happens, when the home health aid doesn't show up or can't work because he's not cleared, let the agency or the bureaucrats or the government eat that instead of me who loses a day of work and instead of my son who can't get out of bed or off the toilet. Let's change the focus to the lives that are being impacted. Let's know that these people are real people and let's, whatever it costs, let's get it done. And if you want to realize efficiencies after you have met that level of service, of quality, you do it behind the scenes, that's not a problem. But nobody for a second believes they're getting better services for less. And they know that cuts kill. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Wember, and um, I have nothing prepared. Um, and I'm terrified of public speaking, but um, I came here because it, I thought it was really important. Um, I'm, uh, I have um, an adult daughter who um, has cerebral palsy. Uh, she uh, is quadriplegic. She uses a motorized wheelchair. She graduated from Brooklyn College. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I, she would have loved to go away to college like Michael's son, only at the time I was working full time and I didn't have the uh, wherewithal or the anything, emotional energy to make that happen. Um, I'm part of a community, uh, my daughter gets, uh, my daughter needs, um, she has high needs, she, need, has, she needs 24 seven care, which we have cobbled together over the years with a combination of CDPA and self-direction through OPWDD. And I'm part of a community of hundreds of uh, families, parents uh, here in the city, across the state, whose kids have similar needs. Um, only um, we just found about, out about this, uh, like everybody said, with less than 24 hours notice. So I'm here, Michael's here, Ralph is here. I don't see any of my other friends here. And I have to echo what everybody else said. That's a big problem. I, sort of a member by proxy of the disability community, um, and we have really been under assault from our governor for a long time now. Uh, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm really tired of uh, hearing the CDPA program being demonized as 
blowing up the Medicaid budget. That's just a false narrative. People like my daughter are not blowing up the budget. She went to college. She lives in the community. My daughter is quadriplegic. Um, and yet, every six months, we have to have a nurse come into the house and a social worker come into the house and make sure that she's still quadriplegic. Well, that's, you know, that's a bit of a waste of time. She's a young woman. Uh, you know, she's, uh, not, nothing's going to change. Um, so that, that will save, I think they have the figures, that's going to save a lot of money right there. If the assessments could like be, maybe once a year they could figure out if she's still quadriplegic. That would be nice, once a year instead of once every six months. Um, and the other thing is, um, if she, if, if my daughter and people like her and the people who've spoken, um, if, if they were not um, getting care in the community, um, the horrible, expensive community care, you know, she would be, in a nursing home, she, you know, she would not be in a group home like many other OPWDD recipients because um, she's not a candidate for a group home. Group homes aren't wheelchair accessible for the most part. Anyway, she's a very high risk for ending up in a nursing home if her care falls apart. And like Michael said, it's a house of cards. If, if the governor's um, idea of what will really save money for people with disabilities um, is having them just sort of disappear or conveniently die, um, that, you know, if, if, if we lose our home-based care and end up in nursing homes, they won't last long in nursing homes. So if that's the governor's idea for saving money on Medicaid, he should just come out and say so. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. And Valerie, what, is this, what does this meeting mean to you? It's my life. It's how I function. And cutting things are not the ideal. I'll be in a nursing home. I'll be not part of society when society is my life. I work. I'm el I, I function as a normal human being. Being disabled does not mean not normal. I pay my taxes and Medicaid helps me survive. So cutting it, redesigning it, to limit my access is not good. Can okay, you think of any concrete thing that could happen to you if you don't, um, if, if it gets cut, like? I'll end up dead. I'll end up six feet under because of the lack of the lack of being able to function. My my medical needs are not going to be met. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. It's not. And you work? I work full time. What do you do? I'm an accessory advocate for the Brooklyn Center for the Independence of the Disabled. Awesome. My name is Valerie Joseph. I'm from the Brooklyn Center for the Independence of the Disabled. I'm an advocate. I'm a person that this affects gratefully with other people in this room. For one, my home care, it affects me gratefully because if I didn't have home care, I wouldn't have gotten here this morning. But you guys should be ashamed of yourself because a lot of other people need to be here and need to voice what they are going through. I don't want to be in a nursing home. I don't want to have somebody have to take care of me and not want to take care of me just because I'm in a nursing home. I am a person who pays taxes. I need to be out in the community. For Accessor Ride, to get here this morning was a hassle for me because I was supposed to go to the office. So I had to rearrange my home care, I had to rearrange my getting around by public transportation. It's unfair. And I'm sure all of you knew when this meeting was gonna be. And it's unfair that none of us were able to come because it was of short notice at 9.30 last night that I was told. And TK, thank you for being on this board, but we need more people like him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, anyway, thank you very much for pulling this um, meeting together, even if there was um, somewhat in I would notice to the community. A number, of, a number of the people commented that they appreciated my inclusion on the MRT, and I'm committed 
to the process. I'm committed to the folks in New York State that use uh, Medicaid for remaining in the community. And I think that it's really important that more people that use the services, particularly people in the home care, the home care part of the budget be here. The reason that many people um, might not have been here today was we were holding a uh, community advisory group meeting yesterday. So I had about 15 people in a room with me, people like Jessica and Valerie and a number of others that you know, we all didn't know about the meeting. So um, I want to say that I'm cautiously optimistic about the process and I will try to do by, by the MRT as well as by the community people that will be impacted by these decisions. Um, I'm going to be continuing to work with the Department of Health and the organizers of the MIT so there can be as much transparency and responsible decision making. But the reason I wasn't here earlier was I had to come all the way from Brooklyn and I ended up taking a taxi to get here. I'm privileged to have the discretionary income to be able to put that money to work to get me to a meeting, even if it is an hour and 10 minutes after it begins. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, th thank you, uh, TK. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your participation and uh, your service to the Medicaid redesign team process. Thank you, Commissioner, um, as well for uh, your service. So with that, um, I thank you all once again, and we'll conclude this session. Uh, please uh, look for, uh, please follow us on the website, the MRT2 website, and we will do our best to get information out there in a timely manner. Thank you. Have a good day.